Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Simon Atkinson toki ngoa. Um, welcome, my name is Simon Atkinson. Um, I'm an independent consultant, a uh, learning strategist based here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, working mostly with uh, international universities, people that were teaching and learning at tertiary level. Um, it's my privilege to deliver this uh, presentation as part of a POD week 2022. Um, it was intended to be a workshop online, but there have been some technical difficulties today. So I said that I would run it as a presentation. Um, I've done a little bit of tweaking. Hopefully it all still makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, I apologise. Um, I just want to say it's a privilege to be part of um, a POTS, Asia Pacific um, Online Distance Education Week. Uh, I am a member of FLANS, the Flexible Learning Association of New Zealand. We have a partnership with uh, ODLA, um, Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. And this week in particular, we are focusing on our relationship with ICDE. It's also worth noting, I think, that there are also weeks, uh, events that are happening this week for the EDEN network in Europe and the US DLA, obviously in the United States. So join FLANS if you are based in New Zealand, join ODLA if you're based in Australia. You have the benefit of joining both organisations at once and we would welcome your participation. Um, I'm also fully available. I think I have a fairly uh, decent online footprint, so you can find me in any number of different places. Uh, please do reach out if you have any questions following this particular session. So why definitions matter? Um, arguably they don't. Arguably we can navigate our way through a world with language as long as we have time and as long as we are listening to each other and we understand the context in which someone is speaking. But very often there's a danger that we discuss things with an assumption of our common understanding. And I think this is particularly true in education, particularly true in the last, say, 30 years since the advent of the internet. So the language uh, of communications has changed a lot of things in education. And we have generations of leadership who are using words that may be could be interpreted differently by younger generations. So I just think it's important that we establish what our terms are at the outset. This is particularly pertinent given that yesterday there was a session that explored um, ICDE's contribution to some of this debate uh, and the global advocacy campaign. And there were a couple of things that were made, a couple of points were made during that session which did strike me as particularly interesting. One was that obviously uh, we're using English and English is not the world's language, although it certainly is, dominates a lot of the educational literature. There is an argument to say that we should be very cognizant of the fact that we are speaking to people sometime whose first language isn't English. And whether or not the English speaking world itself has a common frame of reference is also important. So one of the ideas was that out of this workshop session we would give you the opportunity to just allow you to articulate your own practical usable uh, definitions of these key educational terms. Now obviously I won't be able to measure that in, a, in an online presentation but there will be an opportunity for you to engage through a Padlet a little bit later on. So the structure of this presentation uh, drawn from the workshop was essentially a focus on a series of presentations and I was going to ask participants to hold their questions just so that I can get through my what I think might be quite contentious definitions. Um, I would still invite your reactions and so there will be a Padlet which uh, we won't have breakout groups to populate those but I would encourage you uh, if you have some time to visit those the definitions and comment on them maybe add your own uh, definitions if you think mine aren't appropriate. I want to focus on the use of these terms, open, distance and flexible, very much in the context of learning. They obviously have other 
vernacular uses, um, but I think it's important that we focus on learning. And just to focus even more narrowly on forms of learning, so there are four forms of learning prescribed by UNESCO, formal, non-formal, informal and incidental learning. And sometimes even within higher education, we sometimes use language which can be sometimes misleading. The important thing to differentiate incidental learning from formal learning, non-formal and informal learning is that those first three are all intentional. The learner intends to learn something as opposed to accidentally learning something in you know, watching TV and you learn a fact and you might absorb that fact, but it wasn't your intention to learn in that form. The distinction between non-formal and formal learning is that there is always some kind of imposed curricula or syllabus. Now, there was a whole other debate about the notion of the hidden syllabus, but I think there's a distinction to be made be between having a formal syllabus and having a pathway defined by the learner themselves. The distinction between formal learning and non-formal learning is that ordinarily formal learning would have academic credit associated with it. It's compulsory education. Uh, non-formal learning very often has non-credit awards, badges, CPD points and certifications and the like. I'll give you any, a way by, by way of an example, we might say that a BA history and architecture student is looking to identify buildings that have historical value within their particular city. Uh, they have lectures on that, they have seminars on that, they might study maps, they might study historical references, and they'll go out and look for those in the landscape. A non-formal learning version of that might be a local history community class. There is a structure to that class, there is a syllabus, but there is no formal credit associated with that learning. Informally, someone who happens to be a history buff might have looked up any number of websites, they might have looked up some YouTube videos, they might be party to local discussion groups. They will be building, if you like, their own syllabus. As opposed to someone who accidentally observed the fact that a particular building had a plaque on it that said, Charles Darwin lived here. Right? So there are different forms of learning. All of the learners are learning something, in three categories, it's doing intentionally, one accidentally, one for credit, one for not for credit. So I think the context of usage that I'm looking to explore for open, flexible and distance learning is very much within the formal learning space, both at tertiary but also at secondary school and professional adult learning where it's formal learning. And I'm interested in its use within peer reviewed publications, in professional guidance, so blogs, uh, websites, university websites, polytechnic websites and so on, student facing materials and institutional marketing. And I think it's that last category is very much the, the, the problem child in this discussion. But I think it's important that we just recognise there are any number of different uh, contexts in which language can be used. This is the context in which I want to explore those three terms. So I'm hopefully delivering something that's a little bit provocative. I also want to recognise that there is a division between pre-World World Wide Web and post-World Wide Web. One of the questions in the workshop would have been to have people categorise themselves in terms of what generation of uh, learner they were by age, because I think there is definitely a correlation between the stricter use of words for those of us that are older than those that are younger. And I suspect that the confusion uh, of language use in part it owes to the digital revolution that we've all encountered in education in the last 30 odd years. I think I want to uh, challenge some of the assumptions that there is a collective understanding of what these so-called established terms mean and particularly when they're adopted into new contexts. So while I'm talking through my examples today, I would encourage you to be thinking about what definitions you already have. You may want to pause the video and make some notes as to what your definition of open learning, distance learning uh, and flexible learning might be before you carry on. But I also want to have you bear in mind the fact that the environment that we're teaching in and sharing is also radically changing 
we have to think about what impact, say, a metaverse might mean, or indeed the impact of increasing work-based learning. So I'm going to declare my position up front, which is I think these three words are all distinct. I don't think they should ever be used as synonyms for each other. I think that open is a, a word that's best used when we talk about policy of education and that distance and flexible are terms that are used when we talk about the practice of education, particularly in learning design. I think distance is one of two modes of learning and I think flexible covers any number of models of delivery and that's what I'm going to try and cover now. So when we think about open learning we can think about its corollaries in other domains of education or other aspects of education. So we talk about open access publishing in academic publications. We talk about open educational resources and open education. We also talk then about distance learning, distance education, flexible learning, flexible education. All of those terms, I think, give us a clue as to the distinction between open and distance and flexible. And I say that because I think open is best equated as a question of access Historically, the origins of the Open University movement was very much about giving people access, lowering barriers to access. So if we think about what the antonym would of, of open would be, it would be closed, right? And so if we think about it in publishing terms, we would say closed publication is paywall published or proprietary publishing. We also have education resources versus proprietary resources, and we have some form of selective education. So those of us that have been party to any number of educational systems in the developed world, there's the argument about, certainly in public education versus private education, the degree of selectivity that's imposed. So I think it's quite clear that open access is the key word. And I think it's really about lowering barriers to access. It's about trying to articulate a lack of prerequisites. And very often it's about open enrolment. And the corollaries of those would be, the, the antonyms, the opposites of those, would be to say that it is selective based on age, religion, geography, gender, could have many prerequisites for enrolment. And very often those courses are very heavily timetabled. So there is nothing particularly um, op uh, open, for example, about signing up to a local primary school in the public sector in New Zealand or in the UK or indeed in Canada. There will be there are a number of, of defining uh, prerequisites that would allow you to access that particular school. So open is very much something that is influenced by government and to some extent institutional policy constraints. Faculty have very little ability to turn their learning into open learning if they don't work in an institution that has pre-configured themselves to do that. And students have zero influence over the degree of openness. So openness for me is very much about institutional policy. Now, it should never be used as a synonym for flexible. There are a number of websites, I think, that are very confusing when they define what the open education movement means. Again, I suspect that that is a misuse of the word. Yes, access is part of it, but then they load any number of other theoretical models on top of it. So I think we just think we should really just use open when we talk about institutional policy uh, regarding access to learning. And that's defined at an institutional level. The term distance, which is one of those practice words, is increasingly difficult to define given the context of the ubiquitous communication environment that we now live and work in. In the Western world, in the developed world, um, in Europe, North America, here in New Zealand and Australia, uh, and in a great many places in the world, we now have pretty much ubiquitous Wi-Fi access, uh, internet access, and it may be that that is changing the nature of students' engagement with their sense of distance and separation. We've seen that through the COVID-19. The, the 
the danger of equating distance to remote learning is one of the big policy challenges that we as organisations, as ICDE, Flans, uh, Odler and others uh, are now facing. The experience that students had when working remotely has not been particularly good and we need to not equate distance and remote um, in the same way. So I want to unpack what I think distance means. Historically, it meant that degree of isolation or solitary learning. The rural worker, the remote worker, the, the, the lighthouse keeper, those people that were working unable by virtue normally of location to work with others close to them. Now, I think it's better thought of simply as some degree of physical distance from the teaching venue. Sometimes the campus, not always a physical campus, but the physical distance between the learner and where teaching is happening is what defines distance. And it's not a hard, fast line, but I think we can see it almost in binary terms. Historically, we would have had technology to facilitate that learning. It would have been correspondence, so then it turned into radio with some degree of telephone support. Then we had computer-mediated mediated conferencing, which became a very big deal in the 1990s, 2000s. And then more recently, we've had video conferencing. And so as we've developed a degree of technology to facilitate some of the learning that's happening at a distance, we've seen a, a, a gradual movement from asynchronous learning in correspondence models to synchronous learning in video conferencing modes. And I think the use of technology is one of the reasons why we have a lot of um, obfuscation around some of the terms that we're using. And we need to always put it into a context. So if we are going to use words liberally, we need to define the technological context whilst at the same time not over relying on the use of technology as the means of delivery. Uh, we have to recognise that technology is not always available to everybody at the same time, at the same level. And so it's important that we just acknowledge that. So we think about distance as being about physically distant. What's difficult is that there is no direct antonym of distance. Um, think about proximity is probably the closest, you know, but the word distance doesn't have a direct opposite. And so what we're talking about opposites as being corporeal or in the flesh or in proximity or tangible. But obviously we realise that now with all of the synchronous technologies, with the uh, Zooms and the, the Microsoft um, team and Google Meet and, and all of the other technologies that are available to institutions and to learners, the difficulty about defining the opposite of distance as being in person is obviously problematic because you can be virtual but in person. And so it's very difficult to find a direct um, antonym for, for distance. But I do think if we think about it as simply one of two modes of learning, so there are, in my language, there are literally just two modes of learning. And this is defined in terms of what the learner is actually experiencing at any given time. So they may be physically distant from a teaching venue. They might be working on their own and they are therefore working at a distance. They're learning at a distance. Or they may be physically present in some corporeal form to interact with others, in which case they would be working with others in that physical space where they can literally touch the tutor or touch their students within whatever social conventions are acceptable, obviously. The important thing is they can't be in both modes of learning at the same time. That's absolutely critical from a time perspective. It's really important to recognise that we can design courses that facilitate and leverage both of those modes of learning, and I'm going to come on to that in just a moment, but those modes of learning are quite distinct. You cannot be both physically distanced from the teaching venue and physically present to interact with others, physically present to interact with others. So those are two modes of learning. Where it gets very interesting, of course, is when we think about it in terms of how we arrive at a definition. And I think 
this is going to be particularly problematic. But I don't think distance should ever be used as a synonym for flexible, uh, blended, hybrid or high flex. And I'll come on to do some definitions around that in a minute. Nor should current leadership assume that the term has retained its meaning. So it's very difficult, I think, for some of the um, older leaders of our institutions to recognise that distance doesn't mean what it meant 30 years ago. Um, they may have lost track of, to some extent of how language is being used. That's not to say that it doesn't have value and it's very much a safe haven word for a lot of people, but it may be that it's worth challenging it. So I think it should only be used when using define pre-digital means of learning support. So if we talk about correspondence type remote learning, so if we're working with people in prisons, for example, who don't have access to the internet by virtue of their incarceration, they will be learning at a distance. They'll be using learning distance materials to learn. But that's a dwindling population. If we choose to define distance as a mode of learning, then any activity that a student does independent of their cohort or independent of their tutor, that would be distance. So I as a, as a university student many, many, many years ago, spent more time in the library than I actually spent in individual um, sessions with a tutor or with other students. Um, and so in some ways, my mode was to work at a distance. So I think it should only be used for predefining pre-digital learning support or to define as a mode of learning that the learner is experiencing. So then we get on to the, the fun, which is flexible, which is very much the, 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 the in vogue word, I think, possibly at the moment. And it comes for all kinds of reasons. It becomes very problematic from a policy perspective and arguably definitions are evolving as we speak, partly driven by, as I say, the digital facilitation tools that are available. So I see flexibility as a function of curriculum design and therefore I think it's about models of delivery. It's not a mode of learning, it is a model of delivery. And something is either flexible or it's inflexible. There are other words I think that can be used quite usefully, uh, rigid or fixed. And if you think about it in curricular design terms that makes sense, right? You have a some kind of flexibility within the curriculum experience or it's rigid or it's fixed. And that's going to be a, a fluid spectrum. There are four categories, I think, that primarily are uh, of interest from the way from a learning design, curriculum design perspective that impact on flexible learning. Time, choosing when to study, location, where to study, assessment, as in choosing, where, choosing how to be assessed as well as possibly when, and duration, which is the time frame for completion. Now, in an ideal world, students would be able to make all of those choices. The reality is, of course, that a lot of program and course design is existing within institutional constraints, and there are institutional constraints imposed on some of the, the aspirations for flexibility. I think the key ones are assessment and duration. Um, which a lot of institutions are struggling with. Assessment is largely because quality systems are deployed at scale. There's also the issue about what it is you're actually trying to get a student to assess and whether it's fair and equitable to allow one student to spend four weeks developing a portfolio when someone else spending six months uh, generating a portfolio for assessment. Um, there is also the issue about making sure that you're assessment is situated and contextualised and so on. So the assessment issue is a big um, hindrance for institutions to be able to, to introduce any true flexibility. And the reality is that most universities, polytechnics and indeed schools rely on funding regimes that rely on reporting schedules and that will require, uh, require institutions to predefine the duration of enrolment. So those are institutional constraints. Where there is some room for innovation is in the choosing when to study and the location of where to study. And so what we've seen in these models of delivery, we've seen some development in the last 20 years around degrees of innovation. Certainly as we've introduced more virtual learning platforms, the platforms that we're talking about, 
are facilitating some degree of flexibility. It does empower the student to do some things remotely from others, um, to do things in their own space at their own time. But I think it's important to also just recognise that there is a lot of ambiguity now as the language is developing around even these three terms, and there are, there are more recent terms, blended, hybrid and high flex. So I think blended is um, relatively straightforward. It's the combination of online and campus-based learning. So it's based around a combination of face-to-face -face teaching and online delivery. The important thing is that each mode is designed for. So there's a particular activity that we're going to do in class, this particular activity you're going to do remotely. You have no, you don't have a choice, you can't switch them around. This is prescribed as part of the curriculum design. They're not the same as hybrid and high flex. They are, it is quite a quite distinct model. There are any number of subcategories under blended. Probably the most well known would be the notion of the flipped classroom. But there are any number of different versions of what blended might look like. But it is always predefined by the tutor or the course designer. It's about making sure you're doing what you should be doing in class and making sure what you're doing online um, appropriately. Hybrid is where some of the ambiguity comes in. Um, this was actually drawn from a US academic development site, US university's development site that describes hybrid course as students are required to attend both an in-class session typically once a week and complete the remainder of their coursework online. That is not a definition I'm happy with as hybrid. Um, that is arguably a definition of blended and it is arguably nothing, absolutely nothing new in the last 30, 40 years. The only possible origination is that the classwork is done, quote, online. But the idea that you would go to class and then do some work uh, outside of class is not at all radical. And I suspect that this institution is just latched onto the word hybrid because it's sexy, it's a marketing term, it implies a degree of flexibility but it's completely used completely inappropriately. The definition below is also drawn actually from a UK um, development site, but I think it also uh, it reads much better, which is there is no separation between digital and on-campus student cohorts. Students are brought together by way of teaching is designed and students being able to move easily between digital and classroom-based learning activities. Now, I'm going to go one step further than that in just a moment. Um, but I think that is very, it is crucial to think that it brings the cohorts together. So whether the student is working at a distance or whether they're working in, uh, in, in a non-distance mode, that is um, something that we will just look at in just a second. High flex is, and there are a number of spellings, sometimes there's a hyphen, um, is not the same as hybrid. Um, and this is another definition I actually pulled from another UK site that says high flex is a type of teaching in which some students are physically present in class and others join the same class at the same time from a distance. I don't think that's what defines high flex. I think that might be what defines hybrid. And certainly the definition I'm going to give does reflect that. High flex differs from hybrid because it implies choice from asynchronous engagement as well as synchronous participation when the student feels it's advantageous to them. So that's a real challenge for learning designers to design learning that allows a student to say, yeah, I can read these outcomes. I can see what the objectives of this lesson is. I would benefit by going online and participating in a webinar or going into class, physical class, and sitting in a tutorial or a seminar, or I might literally just want to read a book or read a chapter in a book or a couple of articles. So the student is given the degree of choice as to how they actually want to learn. And so high flex is very much a, a hybrid flexibility mode, but I think it's true flexibility in learning design. So my broad definitions are blended allocates tasks to specific modes of learning. Hybrid enables active participation in real time through whatever technology is available and high flex enables learners to choose which learning activities enable, enabled through whichever means suits best their learning disposition. So hybrid really is, the simplest definition of hybrid is that you're teaching to classes that are consist of people who are sitting on Zoom, 
a Zoom class and at the same time you're delivering a tutorial or a lecture or a seminar in the classroom. That's the simplest definition, I think, of hybrid learning. And obviously, there's to some extent, there's a degree of um, pedagogic innovation that has to happen at various different stages. I would argue high flex and blended are two of the hardest things to design for, hybrid slightly less easily to design for, you can get away with more, but obviously to do it really well, to get that engagement of people that are working on Zoom or, or whatever virtual platform you're using and the students in the classroom can be quite challenging. So my position is that flexible has no synonyms. Blended, hybrid, flexible are models of delivery that are subsets of flexible. They're not synonyms of each other, and wherever you use them in any academic writing or any guidance, you really do need to define them, um, as indeed these university sites have, although I don't know how widely they read before they actually produced those definitions, because I see them as wholly inaccurate. Um, that might be arrogance on my part, but I believe they probably need to go and rework some of those definitions. Um, I think there's a danger about wanting to hype things up and make things sound digitally sexy for what's perceived to be a younger digitally native um, population, where in reality the student needs to understand their choices. So it really should be about using the word flexible to differentiate a degree uh, of of design and learning that enables a degree of choice on the part of the student. So I just want to clarify again my position. I believe that open is a word that's used when we talk about the policy of education. It's about access to some extent about social justice. It doesn't say anything directly about the fact that a course is designed as being distance or flexible, although clearly very often and certainly historically, the notion of, of lowering barriers to access has led people to increase the amount of distance and flexibility within their design. But we shouldn't ever conflate those three terms in the way that we do. Distance is a mode of learning. It's just literally you're either working at a distance or you're working in some in-person slash corporeal form. Uh, those are two modes of learning. And from that's from a student perspective. So a student cannot be doing both things at the same time. Um, our use of those terms, I think, do reflect a range of social cultural contexts and uh, be blogging about that in the not too distant future. Flexible is really about models of delivery and flexible learning is really the way most learning is aspiring to go now. We aspire to design learning that is to some degree flexible. Uh, it, it manifests itself in various models of delivery and the purpose of it is to enable student choice and enable participation. So I would um, welcome you to access this particular Padlet, which will be open uh, for at least uh, the next uh, few weeks. I suspect probably until the end of November 2022, it will still be available. I may even lead it, leave it up um, long term. Uh, and I put three definitions, a definition for each of these. And I'd be very curious to know whether you agree with these definitions or whether you would like to change them, whether you'd like to comment on them in some way. Um, please feel free. It won't be moderated, so um, unless you report any uh, abuse, I will just leave it to do its own thing. I'm going to put these three definitions up now very briefly, but by all means, welcome to pause the video and read them. I'm not going to read them out. Um, I'm just going to put them up for you and I would encourage you to engage through the panel. So I'd also be curious to know if there are any other words or concepts that you think are problematic. So please do feel free to email me if you've got a particular series of words or things that you think is worth unpacking. You might want to know my opinion or you may want to just get some sense of whether you're thinking the words that you see is problematic in your practice might impact uh, on others. Um, I just like to plug the Journal of Open, Flexible and Distance Learning, which obviously uh, is open for submissions around all of those uh, usages of 
policy and practice around open, flexible and distance learning. Uh, I'm one of the editors alongside um, Alison Fields. Um, we're open for calls of papers. Um, please do have a look and see what you think. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found that useful and look forward to having some of your feedback.